Hello and welcome to the Baby Giants Investing Podcast. Join us as we chat about the weird and wild world of small cap investing, all while searching for the precious few fast-growing businesses that have a shot at becoming industry giants. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Podcast guests and their clients may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. All right, we're live. We've got a full house this week again. Very good to have you here, gents. What should we talk about this week? We'll, got, we'll chat about Howard Mark's latest memo, some recent developments with a couple of small caps and one that Andrew talked to last week. But maybe to kick off a little bit of good news, there's always a, like a list of things that I have that were good news, but I actually quite liked one that you sent through to us earlier the week, which was the Quest 3's piano AR tool, which just to me, I know that it's like, I guess it's not that much of a breakthrough for a lot of people, but to me, I think that that's kind of like the promise of AR. So, oh, Andrew, do you want to describe what it was that was in the video that you sent through? You, you might be familiar. Anyone who has played a bit of Guitar Hero in their time or similar games like that will be familiar with it. There's some pretty cool iPad apps as well, where basically rather than reading music, which is a, a, a specialized skill, I would probably argue you need to sort of know what you're doing there. You just see these bars come down and it tells you sort of what keys to hit. With the AR goggles, it just overlays onto your real world piano. In fact, you don't even need a real world piano. It will generate a piano for you. But if you have a real world piano, it'll it'll generate these lines, these colored lines that come down and tell you what keys to hit. They'll actually put the notes on the key, like this is an A, this is an E, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just like a really, it's one of those cool use cases that you didn't think of and you didn't think you need it until you saw it. It's like, I need that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, basically it's mapping physical reality. It knows where all the, like it can, it's got vision, right? So it sees all the keys. And so it, it first picks up your existing real piano. And then as you say, just lays down these tunes. So you can basically be a pianist savant just following this like paint by numbers thing that only you see. You're wearing a big goofy headset at the moment. Like it's not small, like a cool little glasses. Yeah. To me, that's the, that's just highlights the promise of AR. Like just that you can, it's like an augmented on top of your existing reality that just makes you like a genius or whatever else you want it to be like it's i just think that's incredible uh, i don't want to take i don't want to take it into bad news it's not bad news it's good news but i think it's probably more like learning right surely like you're not going to be able to play mozart by just because you can see which uh, well dude, to I, press. I, like to get the timing and the and everything sounding good next time you're in town i'm going to dust off guitar hero and i am going to show you just how fantastic i am at that thing. i have sung a lot of hours <laughs> And it's like actually but I I play Jimmy <laughs> Hendrix all the time. <laughs> now Okay, it's not a real guitar, but I, I've been, there's been many a late night in my boxer shorts, you know, with a tie tied around <laughs> my forehead, rocking out, thinking that I was Jimi Hendrix. And uh, yeah, okay, probably not Mozart, but it's it's kind of uh, it's, it's it is live though. It's not just to learn the piano and how to play piano because it is it is just like yeah, like guitar. So you, as long as you could keep up with what I was instructing you, but yeah, I mean you do need to develop the skill to move your fingers fast enough to keep up with but it. But if you're playing like, like the up and down of like some Mozart piece like it's muscle memory that's playing it like you can't you can't like look at something and press press the key fast enough to like how you do it well, like, i don't I know don't... let's see andrew with guitar hero yep have you seen yeah. these guys at dance dance revolution like yeah. they move pretty fast <laughs> <laughs> you see you get on youtube right, and you see some any, kids any if there are any listeners here who are serious pianists you got to write in and, and give us your opinion on this like is it a learning tool or could someone really use it to to play mozart i mean you could immediately learn it to play you could learn it to play a lot of songs right you're obviously not going to be as good as a someone who's practiced for 20 years but the fact that you can if you can keep up with that you could like i could play a song right now not knowing the piano it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the the, the best song ever but i wouldn't be able to do that at all otherwise right it okay take, i could play twinkle, 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 little hours. Star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah twinkle twinkle yeah. little star is mozart by the way so all right I'm, I'm out on my own here like but yeah no i think that for the fast I think you just need to think of it like it's like it. it's a bit like chat gbt like you could write an essay now with just a prompt like obviously that's not hopefully not going to be as good as the greatest thing that the best writer could ever write but I think it brings brings people up from a low level to like a surprisingly good level very quickly. And then for learning, it would be like an AI coach. You could have a coach that's like sitting with you all the time. Mm. You know, what did you do wrong? Because it knows what you're doing with your fingers. That's the thing that's impressive. It's it's also looking at what your fingers are doing. That's not that's the other big thing of Quest Three. So I used Chat GPT the other day to like replicate some of the coding work we used to do, Matt. And that made it. Mm. I I didn't test it or anything, but it like it made it. I was like, oh, you could do it a lot faster with this. I reckon. Yeah, I think that's weird to think about this stuff because people are like, oh, I shouldn't learn to code. And may maybe it gets there. But I also think in the meantime, 
if it doesn't go fully there. It just makes coders way more powerful. Like if you do know a little bit of the basics so that you can check a few things, like it, you can, yeah, it's like, it's like a super upgrade or something. Yeah, it's yeah, powerful stuff. I agree with that. I think that when I when I revisit that sort of thing, it, the expectations around my output will be a lot higher, you know, now that you've got those kind of tools. Like, I don't, I'm not sure it necessarily benefits the end guy that's hacking away, but certainly, you know, you would have thought. But it also changes the way you can structure things as well. So, like, e each piece of work can be replicated with small changes quite quickly. So, you can probably iterate quite more effectively i would argue so that yeah that's interesting but there was a bit of good news i had for you actually because i thought it was all the you know that's the, the, the sci-fi stuff that you like we need we need some good news this week too so a new level of biological hand prosthesis that sort of fuses into the nerves went to a woman who had excruciating phantom limb pain. She said, I felt like I constantly had my hand in a meat grinder, which created a high level of stress and conventional prostheses were uncomfortable, unreliable. And this changed when she received the groundbreaking bionic technology that allowed her to wear a much more functional prosthesis comfortably all day. The high integration of the prosthetic hand relieved her pain and has been life-changing. So that's the Bionics Institute. Do you know what? All I heard there, Claude, is that I can have a robot hand. <laughs> It is I was like actually going to ask that. Like, at what point do people just start upgrading? Like, <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I mean, there's plenty of sci-fi movies that have that, and they all seem quite violent. So, mm. yeah, good news, bad news. I don't know. We'll see. I what guess. What do you do with a robot arm aside from punch people? <laughs> <laughs> what else is there to do? I think you know, and just just crush things yeah. unnecessarily crush things. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very cool. She's like probably using it to do her hair herself or something like no no i mean in a movie like, and a bunch of, it's not and exciting a bunch of boys movie are like, yeah let's movie. hit people with it <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair enough all right maybe we should move on from good news to uh, i don't know he's he's claude small cat news it is Oh, I was going to say we could do the Doomer news to kind of balance it out. Yeah, first, okay. Maybe. The um, I don't know if it's yeah. Doomer that. I don't know if it's Doomer. What would you say? Is that uh, to be fair, I said that without having read it. I just okay. assumed we were talking about Doomerism. It's so. not good news. It's not good Let's news. Let's have it. Oh, it is. Okay. I was spot on then. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you want to give an outline? Andrew says, further thoughts on C Change. It's Howard Mark's latest memo. Howard Mark's a very well regarded investor who writes regular memos. And for a while, yeah, I guess has been has been more negative on, on things for a little while. But yeah, Sea Change was a, a thought-provoking memo published in December 2022, arguing that there's basically a big change to markets. And this is further thoughts on Sea Change. So yeah, what, what were your thoughts on the memo? Yeah. So, I mean, this is a must read. I like, you know, all investors know that you, you read Buffett's annual letter. And I, I think this is way up there. I'm, I'm just a huge Howard Marks fan. Uh, the most important thing, his book is also well worth a read. Anyway, so the, the, the main point here is that really that we have had a very unusual period over the last, well, really since the GFC of ultra low interest rates. He makes the point by sort of saying, usually when someone says this time, it's different, you know, it, you got to be careful with that but occasionally it is and he feels as though this is one of those scenarios there's a really nice john kenneth galbraith quote in there as well talking about the extreme brevity of financial memory <laughs> and just making the point that like pretty much anyone who's come into the business since 1980 which is pretty much all of the world's investors today except for some of some of the old soldiers uh, have only seen interest rates either de declining or ultra low so we have this sort of scenario where what we consider normal i think with a wider lens on history you would say is actually quite unusual and he's just making the point and he, look he's he's not I, I was joking before it's not doomerism he's not sort of saying you know run for the hills and you know buy a shotgun and a pack of seeds it, it's more just that if you are expecting this ultra easy environment where we just had free money flowing around which made business very easy and, and prevented a lot of probably failures that needed to happen and that capitalism demands kind of happens just didn't happen and it was also as we often well, have often spoken about too it just means that valuations i think need to be looked very differently think about it this way guys i was thinking about this the other day who in god's green earth is buying tells i mean you'll you'll have a boomer go well you know it's a great dividend and it's fully frank it's like yeah okay but that's that's what six six and a half percent grossed up i'm getting 5.8 i can shop around and get a 5.8% 12 month term deposit now, you know, and I don't have to have exposure to a business and the volatility of the markets. And let's not forget a business that's pretty much just only going in, well, has been going in one direction. Maybe they turn it around. I think there's a lot of companies on the ASX where it's sort of like, I uh, give me a reason to do this. I, the, the, if, if, 
if you were saying, oh, yes, but they're about to achieve really strong above system growth, it's like, okay, you know, you don't need a high yield when, when that's there. But it's like, really? I mean, what what's the most bullish call that you have on dividend growth on Telstra? And and I I don't know. I, I feel as though this, this is the point that I think he is making. Here. My most bullish call is who cares? I just it's like, I don't get it. I don't. I mean, I get it if he's just like, well, I just care about dividends and income is like, well, yeah, fair enough. It's plenty of people rightly care about that stuff and it's appropriate for them, but it's like, why? Opportunity cost is one of the biggest concepts you need to get Mate, your head around. It's probably, right? it's probably post-sport children just piling into stuff that they perceive as as blue chips and, and index hugging funds, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know what I mean? Madness, dude. I actually posted something on X the other day. Actually, why am I saying X? I've got to call it. Yeah, I caught, myself, I caught myself. I caught myself just- call it X. <laughs> It's because I went to my favorites to find it well. <laughs> but it's just like the ASX 20 just, is a lesson just in Just imagine mediocrity. how irritating it is to Elon that everyone still calls it Twitter. Or- <laughs> yeah, Twitter. You're right. I went to Twitter. I, I posted this on Twitter the other day. I just went to S&P and got the, the ASX 20. It's like over the last 10 years, all right, like it's like 6.9% CAGR. Dividends reinvested. It's like, And you just, you look through it and it's just like, oh my God. Gosh, it's like really, really, really ordinary. And again, maybe things are different as, as Marx is making the point of, but this was a period of ultra low accommodative rates, easy money, very above average valuations and multiples. And I, I just, you know, it just, it kind of blows my my brain a little bit. And I think, and I'll, I'll say one more thing and I'll shut up. He made the point, which I've been quite, as you guys know, a bit big on lately is, is that the Fed has just basically artificially depressed rates for too long. And he just made the point that this distorts economic and market participants' incentives and behavior and just leads to all kinds of really negative sort of outcomes. So you're saying my, my growth stonks PE multiple won't go to 40 to 120 again? You know, here's, here's another interesting chat came up on straw man. So I, so we've, we've, and the market has been very rightly focused on Zempic, right? CSL, well, ResMed at first, and now CSL sort of copying a little bit of it. And I think a lot of people are piling into that because they, in my view, correctly surmise that the Zempic impact is overblown. I think that's, I, you guys might have a different view, but I, I feel as though that's not a zero impact, but maybe the degree of impact is overblown. But I do think that expecting things to go back to the up those prices on the assumption that we will see a quote unquote normalization of multiples is in the context of what we've been just, just well, what I've just been crapping on about, maybe unreasonable because you've got, these are great, I mean, let me say this before everyone gets angry because it really sort of ruffles feathers when you say negative things about these companies. ResMed and CSL are two of the highest quality companies on the ASX, hands down. I love them. They're, they're fantastic businesses, but they were trading at very, very high, for, for multi-billion dollar companies. And yeah, plenty of growth still in them, but they were trading at extraordinarily high multiples. I'm kind of making the case, or my thinking is more increasingly turning to this view that it's actually, especially in a world of of more reasonable interest rates, that it might not be reasonable to expect CSL to go to a PE of 40. Actually, if you look at CSL since 2019, it's back, it's at a four year low. And you think, well, how does it, and, and its earnings have grown well over that period. It's like, yeah, but in 2019, CSL was trading at a PE of 43 or something like that. And it's a classic, classic example of a really high quality stock that actually did achieve some really impressive growth, despite the headwinds and a few hiccups. I'm like, I know that there's nuance there and there's a few things that have sort of happened. But I don't think anyone thinks that growth is over for these companies. It's I think the flawed potential flaw in some of the commentary out there is this like a Zempic will blow over and they'll go back to a PE of 40. I think that's what I question. I, I think if if in yeah, a, yeah, I agree with that. In a I world of, of higher interest rates, a P of 25, 30 is probably more reasonable, even with that. So they're, they're probably I'm, fair I'm value. I'm the, and- the bounce trade. For ResMed, that's I'm, I don't own it, but like that's well, that's a trade, a and that's because it's just that's like a, such an extreme sentiment at the moment around like how much. Oh, totally, I get that. Going to change, but, but that that's a, I say if you yeah, totally. If you want to trade it, then yes, but I think I don't, I don't do it. Though. I don't really trade that much, but 
I'm tempted, you know, if I didn't. Yeah, I, I get, I, and I, if that's if that's the thesis, then I I don't. I also bet on the with... on the All Blacks, so you know, I guess I've got that. <laughs> wow, I love there it. There we go. There okay, we go. So we got our next twenty minutes are about the Rugby World Cup now. <laughs> 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 did not, did not. You'd be a crazy man to. Okay, can I? Just, I'll I'll say one thing for anyone listening who, like me, doesn't always read the Howard Marks stuff. This one was pretty reasonable. The main conclusion is, unless there's serious holds in my logic i believe significant reallocation of capital towards credit is warranted though he is a bond written... trader right too let's remember yeah 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 <laughs> every time we see a macro forecast it is the the conclusion is the thing that i sell is the best yes. one but i, I don't yep. think i don't think he's it. pretty he's a pretty honest guy i don't think he's the kind of guy that. yeah but also sure. didn't he write it on may 30 2023 so since then bonds have gone down massively right no this, was this is october this has just come out oh okay but there was part of it because it says at the front this memo was originally sent to oak tea clients on oh, oh okay was the, Oh, okay. On Maybe May right. 30, 2023. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. So if that's true, then he... You're right, Claude. I mean, no, I, right. he got immediately... He got he got. His wrecked. point is... Yeah, his point is there. Like, a lot of endowments say that you have to have, like, whatever it is, 7% return. That's, like, what they're targeting or 7 or 8%. And he's basically just saying, like, you could, I could just give you that contractually with, with interest rates at these levels. Like what Andrew's saying. like Risk-free. Like, you know, term Zero deposits are risk-free, really. but, yep. like, he's, he'll take the next level up above yeah. risk-free, right? So he's, like... He'll still get very this. little normal commercial risk which might add two or three percent you get you you get that target and then he will if he holds on but in the meantime the value would have gone down right yeah yeah exactly so he's talking about new fresh investments and it's pretty funny maybe he's right now he's wrong then he's right now (laughs) now is the bottom (laughs) well it depends what it depends claude like in may if he if he's buying two three year bonds and with the intention of holding to maturity and he's and he's locked in he won't actually get wrecked of course of course yeah he won't you're 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 dead right i was i'm kind of just like flippantly trying to laugh at him a bit i guess but <laughs> you leave howard alone i won't yeah. stand here and let you <laughs> i mean i think basically the I, I think he's a little bit too worried but at the same time you know he's basically saying exactly what you said you know we ha- we've had a pretty crazy easy money period that probably won't be repeated or whatever i think you know there's there's of course so much truth to that not not sure equity markets as a whole like in terms of buying the whole index fund, that doesn't look super compelling to me right now. The only index fund I have is this UMAX one, which you put me on two years ago, Andrew, which is almost just this, I mean, sort of just a yield play, right? Okay. How's it gone? <laughs> I haven't kept track. It's fine. Yeah. It's on you, dude. <laughs> I more compared it to the alternative in my head, which is just like term deposit rates or whatever, which are around yeah. 4.5% yeah. at best. Yep. So it's beaten that. So it's been worth it. You know, in fact, I probably should have put all all the, all the money there, but I only did a tiny bit. That was the thesis. The overall markets don't look super attractive at the moment because you get a decent return just, you know, with zero risk, essentially. And that's definitely going to change things long term. And I, yeah. I guess, the, I guess the, you know, we'll come back to some small camps that we like or are interesting in a minute because I think the other thing is for us, we don't need to buy the whole market, right? So like there's a, there's a degree where we should read this stuff to understand it. I do think this is probably kind of must read category agree, but it's also like we should just keep in mind we're not trying to do that. So we're we're not trying to say like, will equities outperform credit over the next 10 years? We're more trying to find, I think most of us are trying to find businesses that can grow substantially faster than the average equity anyway. But yeah, I think that the other kind of point I'd make is just the style of investing that works more in this, even within equity. So say you're going to invest in, in equities. I think this enhances reversion to the mean versus winners keep winning. And so I think you need to be more conscious of as cost of capital rises, I kind of like we talked about like gravity returning. And as a guy that likes to merge like value and growth, I'm kind of excited by that because a lot of stuff could get just keep get propped up forever before and now you actually have have to have more of a it's it's like the analysis becomes more valuable right because if something can have a return on capital of 15 percent, it's suddenly a lot more valuable than something that only does 10 or 5 yes. whereas before so, that was all hidden because the 5 percent ones could just keep raising infinity dollars and keep growing and kind of get there and you know dominate by the end so i think i think it like enhances the returns to thoughtful investing versus not thoughtful kind of thematic yolo style investing and then, so that's kind of what I'm what I'm excited about. It does make it less, bit less. I don't know. Maybe it's less fun because you don't just win for, without thinking about it. But, um, <laughs> that is less yeah, fun. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, when I mean, when all that stuff's pumping, it's like the default state is is I made money. You know, I, I <laughs> hate it. Actually... I, I really hate when things are pumping, and I know it's crazy because it's like, what do you do? Like, do you do you join in a mania? 
Yeah. It's just, I just don't like the, like I, I, I need to have that North star evaluation. So I think if things mm. get too out of touch. Oh, you just um, like, yeah, it feels more. Yeah. yeah. So the setup okay. you're looking for, right? It's the setup yeah, you're looking for. This is so far, as long as we don't have, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Which is a real reminder of how hard that is. So I just, I want to double click on that as the cool kids say, Matt, because <laughs> oh it <God>. is, <laughs> I mean, Dude, a lot of, your, your generation is one step below the boomers, mate. Like, by, the time it re- <laughs> by the time it reaches me, it's not cool. I love how, like kids don't double click because they use a phone as well, right? And no kids <laughs> like, oh, let me double click on that. I love it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, I really lean into that when my kids have friends around actually i just like they just roll their eyes and i love it so yeah so the i think life tiles is a good lesson here right so mm. it's easy to sort of say no i'm going to stick to the fundamentals the, the fundamentals in terms of my investing philosophy right yeah i am not going to get carried away with all this exuberance and yet, yeah that's a very very sensible thing to do but it's just very hard to do when the exuberance lasts for like 13 years, like that is a very tricky thing to do. Oh and then yeah, and then you just, that's too far, right? Like there's plenty of value, quote unquote value investors who like, I'm just going to wait until this whole thing blows over. And I'm not yep. saying that either. No, you're not. You know, like late 2020 was pretty mania in some areas. And it just means you have to go look in other areas, I guess is the answer for an investor. You just, 100%. Or you know how to jump in and out as a trader mentality. But but, yeah. but the other point I was going to make was the chickens do eventually come home to roost. Like reality does rear its ugly head uh, again. And I, I was reminded recently, Oropol on Strawman made, made the point of like, wow, life tiles, what a, what a shit show that has been. And, wow, and uh, that was, that's one of the ugliest little, little ones I've ever seen. But I think it was like, I, I'm, it's going to sound like I'm, I'm dancing on the grave here. It was like, oh, it was so obvious. Well, no, it wasn't. Look, oh, well, so it's, yeah, it's I, out now, is it? No, it's no, not well, listed. Yeah, so so let me let me frame it up for you guys, right? In in twenty when was it? In twenty eighteen, the market cap was north of two hundred and eighty million. Dude, I recommended this from hidden for hidden gems back in the day. Well, I, let me give you some credit before so you before you, you let me give you some I, credit. I also, reason to add, I sold it at like a hundred percent gain at like forty cents or something. Nice. Well, thank. Well, it's the, the market cap is seven million today, right? So you. Yeah, yeah. No, I was like, I realized. I think from the beginning, I was just like, they'd just done a capital raising. All the insiders had bought shares. It was just like ticking heuristics. Like you know, the growth had been good. I felt like, oh, this is just gonna. They're gonna tell a story here, and it gets gonna get hyped. And then that that kind of did happen. But whilst that was happening, the actual fundamental results were concerning, and they kept raising capital and losing tons of money. Well, you picked it like a dirty nose. So let me give you some of those heuristics. I, so the, the argument was just, again, at the time, right? It's just like uh, they were doing 5 million in revenues back then, right? So that is a price to sales of 50 or something. I don't like something insane. But since then, their revenues 10 x through to the end of FY22. So, you know, on one hand, you can kind of go, yeah, I get that. That, you know, like, lit, again, the revenues 10x. The biggest heuristic is, is the growth organic, right? This is actually a good one for learning that lesson because they basically, it wasn't really organic. You're stealing my thunder here, dude. I'm, I'm laying it up. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that build up, mate. <laughs> oh man, spoiler alert. But you're right. I mean, that's you're, you're so right because that is exactly the point here. Like, And, and the other thing is the scale never came. So they grew the revenue, but the share count exploit for, through acquisitions, 470 70 million shares on issue to a billion shares on issue today. And now the strategy is, well, we're going to cut our way to greatness. A couple of other just little factoids that I had to look up. 59 million in intangible assets, mainly goodwill from acquisitions. Again, market cap is 7 million. And they've accumulated losses of 186 million on the balance sheet. But yeah, I guess it's just a nice little pointer to the environment that we've come through, just to tie a bow on this and to to sort of come full circle. This is what Marx was talking about. This was the insanity of an artificially depressed interest rate world with free and easy money allow a company like this in a quote unquote normal time wouldn't have gotten that funding. They would not have had the permission to continue to do what they did, and they certainly wouldn't have been valued at the way that they were. And Lifestyles is not alone here, by the way. So I feel as though there is 
some truth telling with what Marx has done there. And I would think looking at some of these yeah. growth stocks and what they have done, like expect, even those that have that have managed to sort of tick along and have, have a bit of a future, to expect them to go back to the, some of those highs, I don't think will ever happen. Or if it does happen, it'll take a long, long time. Yeah. And maybe just last time at the bow, again, what I think people who were too cautious on whatever was going on markets over the last 15 years ignored was just that there are really high quality companies within all that, right? So there's yes. definitely some that got overvalued, but like if you'd avoided it all, you would have avoided, you know, Amazon, Google, you know, in Australia, Prometicus, LTM, like these are real, th- those aren't going to just reverse back to like that level that they were on because their businesses are up like 10, 50, 100x in revenue and, you know, profit terms. Like that, that's what I think and that's what we can focus on more. And that's going to drive, if you can find those businesses, it'll drive returns much more. So if, if you're not, if you're not following markets as closely and you're like, oh, is everything gonna, that went up going to just come back down? I don't think that's what we're saying either at all. It's just, yeah, you just need to choose the best. All right. Was that a good segue for something, Andrew? What were you I, I thought I was just like, oh man, you're, you're setting it up so well. I'm sorry. I'm hogging the microphone here, guys. Apologies to you. He's going to hit it out of the park now with his segue. <laughs> well, it's getting ready to step on us. <laughs> I just thought that what you were saying there was just like, ah, yes, you were right. So let me, we spoke to uh, Mike Viverk as the CEO founder of, of Jumbo Interactive. It really doesn't need mentioning on a podcast called Baby Giants because it's not, it's like almost a billion dollar market cap now, but it's a really nice example, right? So these guys, Mike started the company in 95. It was an IT, ISP right? And, and a development company. He's a software developer himself, software engineer. They listed in 99 as jumbomail.com. I don't know if anyone of a certain vintage remembers that, but again, notice the .com, you know, and obviously you look back there, the share price ran up anyway, and then, and then fell back down again. But where this is interesting, I think, and this is like the, there's an, this is how it's different from a live tiles. And I'll, I'll sort of try and thread this all together is that with the rise of the internet and some changes in legislation, they found a, a nice little niche in internet lotteries. And what has happened in the last 20 years, they've gone from like sub 3 million in revenue to hundred, almost $120 million the last financial year. So that's a CAGA of 20% per annum over a 20 year period. And the thing that I want to impress upon you guys and the listeners is that that is not just a feature of early growth off a low base. They've actually done that on a per share basis. That's been the top line per share revenue growth in the last five years, right? They've done it incredibly well. And a couple of other things, it's that they have issued more shares. There've been a couple of acquisitions, but I think is whenever I see a company that has succeeded, I think one of the things Maybe it's just the lens I'm looking through now, but one of the things that really stands out is it's just usually a masterclass in capital management. I feel as though that is really the the, the biggest thing that you're trying to have to watch for for these companies. Anyone can grow revenues. You know, if I I'm going to be an iPhone reseller, I'm going to sell them for twenty dollars each. I will sell a lot of iPhones, right? But these these guys have managed to do it very effectively. They've funded themselves largely. They've actually generated net margins, net after tax margins of thirty percent, like. Try and find how many companies have 30% mar- net margins on the ASX. Like you count them on one hand, right? Return on equity of 30%. And they pay out like 80% of, of their profits in dividends. So extraordinarily capital light. And I think one of the, I own shares, so full disclosure here. And um, can, I, can I give a little background, Matt, mate? Um, everything, what you said, very interesting and, and on point. But I just wanted to give a little background about this business for any listeners. We you're going to shoot all over it now, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Okay. Once upon a time, you know, it absolutely was a small cap. And actually, I remember looking at this back in Hidden Gems days and actually not going for it, but I, I down well should have. It is a somewhat interesting business model, though, because it's really not, it just adds a margin on top of lottery tickets of someone else who runs the lottery. I'll challenge that in a moment. But yeah. Oh, nice. I, no, no. Well, you, you can tell the story of how it does that. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, functionally, that's how it makes money is it's got a margin on it. So it is a reseller, right? It's yes, a margin on someone's old product. 80% so of its like, revenues are reselling in Australia. Yeah. So you can get the same product or the, not exactly the same product, I'm sure, but you can get the lottery entry slightly cheaper from a different source. So, Andrew, how does it do it? How does it make money just by charging a margin like on top of it. Well, so the the secret source, according to Mike, and you know, again, he's going to be biased, but he's just like they are a developer first and foremost. They've, well, they've done it though, as you said, they've done they've done it effectively they for just a long did time. It. So here's the here's this was a mind blow, right? So the, it is 2023, and like the online, like it's only like a third of lottery tickets are bought online. What? <laughs> like it just it, it might. And then this is the this is the real mind blow. In the US, it's five to ten percent. First world country. Well, haven't. 
guess. Have a guess as to why that is. And, and put your cynical hat on. Why do, you, why do people not buy it online? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. So that they can, sp- I don't know, it's, transfer it's, it so it's they can be- run away and get someone else to cash it in while they're like going to tax out or something. <laughs> so most of the lottery tickets are sold through service stations. It's owned by big oil companies who happen to have incredibly powerful lobby groups. And these lottery tickets are a nice little owner. So it's basically, mm. we don't want, the legislation to sell online has been very difficult to sort of overcome. And there's, again, this is this is a classic irony of, of America in so many ways, like the home of, you could say capitalism and the you know free markets and all of this kind of stuff but just like man you know it helps it helps to have people in dc right and that is that is why they've had they've had real trouble and they, and they haven't actually gone there but the point i was going to make so the point i was going to make is they've they've got a a tech stack they've spent a lot of money and a lot of time making sure that it is very seamless it's very effective and they've gotten so powerful that for as far as the the counterparty here um, tcl now now called is just like it's too important for them to try and screw over even though they tried to in the early days right so they've just actually they've got an agreement through to 2030 in terms of what happens with what they can charge and how much they have to pay etc cetera, etc cetera. but they have taken their secret source which is their tech stack and they've got two other revenue lines now as well one is a SaaS line so you can just go and sell the, the lottery retailing software to places overseas and and to charities and the like and they've also got a managed services division as well so it's like we'll give you the software and we'll run it sort of for you as well and that's growing really well, they think that that should be half of revenue by the time that the the TCL deal ends. And yeah, I, I just I just a couple of things that stood out to me here with with Mike is that they have such a relentless focus. So so many of their competitors are getting into sports betting and online casino kinds of things. Like, why would I do that for? No one no one has an ethical question with lottery retailing because you can't become a problem gambler gambler with that. So it's like, it's very safe from that perspective. Governments love it because it's a huge source of revenue and they, they they understand where their advantage lies and they ridiculously resolutely sort of focus on that. And Mike is just a guy who's just like, he's, he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And he's just like, he's that lovely, is that what you love in a founder, right? He's there. He's, he's lovely. He's, okay. We've got to definitely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. I've got to stop. Andrew's, I'm in, gonna love. Stop. Andrew's <laughs> in love. But at the same time. I was really I'm, impressed. Mate. I was really impressed impressed no, that's cool. um, when you said you had some do you mean you had some in your straw man portfolio or you have some in real life both oh, okay that's yep. interesting he really yep. mate, mate, it's 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 carrying it's doing some heavy lifting from some other dogs that i've uh, allocated capital to <laughs> oh that's cool I, you should have told me when you bought jumbo because i've always been interested in that but i've oh, never really known when it's to not buy. as large I've as i've never it really made money out of it i've never really made money out of it i've never really called it well i it, it always gives me the jitters with all of it you know reliance on reselling but you didn't say mate how is it that they actually do make the profit on top when they're reselling like what's the selling point why people use them instead of buy it from the lottery company yeah, directly so most people will just go i want to buy a lottery ticket here's the other interesting thing with the dynamics most of the lottery ticket sales happen in the in the hour before the draw oh 60 million you know a few whatsapp messages go around i need it wait, yeah, so so- wait the majority of sales happen in the hour before the draw yeah, yeah. i don't want to put a number i don't think yeah. he put a number on it but it was just like like he was That's saying that their tech wild. sits idle for most of the time really? and then like oh the, oh you'll see an ad on a bus shelter. It's like, oh, $90 million. Oh, that's tonight. Oh, I need to get a oh ticket, right? And so everything sort of comes at that at that point. And you need, he was actually, here's another, here's another sign of a good leader, right? He's like, they turned away a lot of, ticket sales they used to shut things down an hour out because they just couldn't handle the volumes and they weren't sure, confident of, of executing on it and you could imagine if someone's numbers came up and they didn't actually acquire the ticket for them how damaging that could be so a lot of a lot of companies would have taken that money i would imagine what was your question i've gone blank <laughs> well, so claude's question how do they make the margin Oh, why would you? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah, Matt so, said it, Matt said it. Like, what? why is it that someone doesn't choose to buy the same ticket slightly cheaper directly from the lottery company? But have you have you used the lottery company's website? Dude, no. Like, I'm asking yeah. you though. Like, yeah, that's, like, that's, so that's, is that's it the answer. SEO? Is it just usability? Like, what is it? Like, I think, I think it is... They, they rank better. And again, we know how. Yeah, like, because I played with all this years ago when I did briefly own jumbo shares. And I was like, yeah, I reckon it's sustainable. Like, I, I think that it's doable. You know what I mean? But yeah, I, yeah. I sort of figured that the additional margin they were charging was like, yeah, a lot for the extra service, to be honest. Because I think if you just figure out how to do it the cheaper way, it's better. 
but well, that's the Webjet is. argument, right? Wait, but wait. Yeah, well, exactly. And the same Webjet argument is crazy with the lottery because I think that people imagine the extra money relative to the amount that they're going to win or more likely not win. But they're imagining that extra dollar or whatever it is, not as a percentage of the $10 ticket. Yep. Or, by the way, that's made up numbers. But I'm just saying, you know, they're actually imagining that extra dollar relative to the, you know, $61 million that they could win. So I think I think that my that's my theory of why it works. But yeah, I also just think that that's it's an interesting little quirk of it. And then they still are super reliant on their partner, who's the lottery company, because the lottery company can see how much money they're making, and it's like, yeah, we see how good you are at this, and and we're just gonna be like, no, nah, now you give us more, you know. And so that's the thing that comes up every ten years or whatever it is. It was a really good opposite. One, one, they've they've got a lot of clear air, so they've got another seven years of it before anything sort of happens there. They're a much bigger, they've got a much stronger negotiating position now uh, I, I think is is fair i mean it's just it's in the numbers so you can kind of say why would you it's like well i don't know but people people clearly do and oh, i had a point and it's completely escaped me yeah it's gone <laughs> it was a good one though so basically anyway. the answer is it's better better easier to use than the their website and you think that's enough yeah i i think so and it, it's sort of there's a bit of innovation look I, I i'll happily admit i even said it to mike my granddad always called lottery a tax on hope which is so you, which is you exactly use them yourself though andrew you don't go i to buy the, a lottery ticket every week website but do you go yeah. to the cheaper website or do you go to no the... i use jumbo yeah 100 okay, percent. that's do. a good test because you're uh did you do that before you own the shares because i actually did i was actually okay. in a company i worked at years ago we had a syndicate okay. and i was like easier. oh how do i do this i googled it i found it it was easy yeah you're pretty you're pretty good for like a value conscious shopper as yeah. we've established with your underwear. I think that's why I never did it as well myself because like Andrew had done it. So I was just like, listen to him <laughs> tell me about his like regular gambling habit. I think there's a rush. For me, there's a huge amount of rationality in the lottery tick. I'm never going to sit on my deathbed and go, oh my God, I spent $4 every week. Oh, what have I done? You know, whilst we record this podcast, because it's a hundred episode 100 of baby giants oh it is too congrats guys why don't you buy us a lottery ticket man you use okay. jumbo to buy us a lottery ticket oh uh, yeah all right hell yeah let's do it we put in a hundred bucks who's oh, putting up the oh money? whoa 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 how, whoa. Much, <laughs> Wait, no. Look, how much do you think a lottery ticket costs <laughs> i mean i don't know man three hundred dollars it was hundred bucks i don't know how much uh, are we punting? I thought I come on a hundred. I'll put up a hundred dollars. Okay. How many tickets you guys... do you get for a hundred dollars? Oh, for three hundred. Well, here's that's here's the thing: is like if you it, when you. I don't, it's a lot of pressure to put on Andrew to stay honest if we win. So. <laughs> right, yeah, you, I mean, all of a sudden I'm not answering your exactly. messages. You know what's exactly. happening. Exactly. What do we? Yeah, no. You have to send us the ticket though, Andrew. You have to send us it. Like if you so tell us he won this week, then the odds are like pretty high. As one of the six hundred three hundred tickets. I won. He's going to. Be, uh, no, I won on my personal ticket. Yeah, not yeah. On the baby, not on the baby giant. Three hundred dollars worth of tickets. Well, have. maybe maybe I could use their new party lotto party feature oh. too. Uh, to do that. Well, I remember the point I was going to make uh, real quickly. The, I think a couple of nice things about this one too, for anyone who is in a, in a bearish macro kind of mood is that these things are completely acyclical, like lottery ticket sales do not move a dot mm, yeah, during tough times. Yeah, that's another positive of the investment is that people yeah. keep gambling mm, on lotto exactly. consistently. Through it's also the most wholesome kind of gambling as well. Yeah, because yeah. the whole thing plays out or obviously, actually, it's kind of sad to hear that so much happens right before the lotto, to be honest. I would have thought like part of the joy is it is like you buy the ticket and then for the you next week, you're like, yeah. I'm going to buy a jet plane. <laughs> 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 and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, okay. no, we do it, some more it, small caps, though. Let's yep. do something else. Let's move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you go, Matt. I was going to say XTech if you wanted to. Let's cover that because I know that you'd written about it recently on a richlife.com.au and it had um, a pretty interesting contract come through so yeah just keen to keen to hear about x tech from yourself yeah right disclosure i own shares in it and also bought a bit lower than the current price mind you i'm still holding my shares it's a longer it's not like okay, it's a medium to longer term thesis for me it's been a not particularly great uh company over the course of its listed life but in the last couple of years under the leadership of a new ceo and it has been profitable in both of those years and it has two divisions one is essentially reselling surveillance drone equipment to the Australian army. Obviously, by the way, some people may be against that. I personally have zero issue with the Australian army having surveillance drones. Sounds like a great idea, but that's what they do 
and that's a low margin business, obviously, because the Department of Defense can see how much profit they make from it. And they're like, yeah, we're only going to let you have a little profit from doing this. Then their other business is the ballistics business, which is called Highcom Armor. And in fact, XTech plans to change its name to Highcom with and have a new ticker and everything because this is kind of its brand that it owns. And Highcom Technology sells body armor and helmets to you know, the allies. In fact, a huge driver of profits over the last couple of years has been helmets for Ukrainian soldiers defending against uh, the invaders. On top of that, obviously in Europe, the other countries have seen the invasion of Ukraine and, and also upping their army. So they're opening an office in Poland, for example. Poland is expanding its army, obviously need to defend yourself against a neighbor that just invades and, and that kind of thing. So and obviously does a lot of atrocities. So the thing is, it's important stuff and it's good stuff. And the interesting aspect is that they have this machine in Adelaide at the moment that is used to really harden the helmet material. And whilst keeping the helmet light, this allows a hardened helmet in this high pressure, high heat oil kiln or whatever it is, XT clave, they call it, that allows it to stop the bullet of a rifle rather than just the bullet of a handgun. And obviously when you're at war, well, the other people have rifles. So you would like a a helmet that would stop the bullet of a rifle. So obvious application there, they can sell these for a fair bit of money they want to move the machine from adelaide to i think it's ohio in order to be able to throw their hat in the ring as a supplier of the u.s defense force because the u.s demands that anything that they use to supply their army must be fully made and sourced in the u.s itself which of course does make sense if you're the big dog in the world because you don't want someone else to be pesky and annoying and cut off your supply for your for your defense forces. So yeah, that's their plan. And there's obviously some costs associated with this. Now they say they're going to grow revenue. They make no promises with regard to growing profit, but you don't know if the revenue growth could also be more on the, uh, the reselling side, which is lower margin revenue. So it's possible for them to grow revenue and profit goes backwards because if that revenue shifts more to the reselling, the higher margin helmet revenue could go down. And in fact, it quite likely really could when it's going to get fully interrupted and move from Australia to the US and then et cetera, et cetera. So even though they still are selling plenty of helmets, the actual amount of profit could go down, which is why then you see the stock trading on a P ratio of six or seven, or, or I'm not sure what it is at the top of my head, but when I bought it, it was like, like super low. Yeah, that's it. And so that the market you'd say is not assuming that it's going to grow profit every year. But at the same time, if it actually succeeds in moving this XT clave to the USA, getting settled there, and then getting bigger orders supplying the US Army, then it probably will grow profit, at which point you have a potentially no- very noteworthy situation of a company that's growing profit quite a bit and still has a super low PE ratio. So something would change, I would imagine, at that point. How much do you reckon the all the stuff that's going on in the world, particularly in the Middle East at the moment, is impacting the the share price short term? I think surely, so it just so happens that in the last couple of weeks since there's been a further outbreak of violence uh, when Hamas attacked the Israeli settlements, you know, the share price has been going up since then. And it's possible that the market kind of sees just general, you know, problems in the world being a driver of demand for X-Tech through its Highcom armor division and also just generally, I guess a more hostile world would probably increase the amount of money the Australian government is even spending on drones. So you would potentially argue that it does benefit from, you know, some problems in the world, which is obviously why some people actually might not want to invest in it. But yeah, at the same time, it's kind of on the goodies team. So uh, I think maybe that does affect sentiment. But at the same time, what I said about how executing this plan to the USA, I think that's what's going to drive success. So Mm. Mm. the share price might be reacting to other things from what I think will ultimately matter. I think it's interesting, man. We, we spoke to uh, Scott Basham last year. He's coming back on the 7th of November uh, to give us yeah, an Yeah, I'm update. looking forward to it. I'll, yeah. I'll be there in the... That's a, one of the benefits of straw man membership. So, well, actually, if you can if if you can throw in some questions, it'd be helpful because I know you know it really well. Yeah, I will. Yeah, but I'm keen. I'm keen to dig into it a little bit more. I mean, it, it is a company that I mean, like it hasn't covered itself in glory in in the longer arc of its existence, and it's we've spoken of some of the challenges of of operating in this space and like the clients that you're sort of dealing with are very slow moving and 
orders can be very lumpy and all of this kind of stuff. But it is, I agree. I think it's interesting. And it's so capital I'm, intensive, right? As yeah, well. very, yep, absolutely. In, in terms of at least the helmet side of the business, they've got inventories, et cetera, to, to worry about and manage and, yep. and think, raw materials. Yeah, I think it's also interesting how the war in Ukraine just sort of reversed all that for a while at least like how they have like a very large purchase order come through because everything it's everything's in a rush right when, yes. when the u.s is this huge budget and they're trying to procure as quickly as possible so all of that goes the other way you get better margins like short procurement cycles you don't have to worry about inventory like all that stuff so i guess that would be the thing to watch out for over the like medium longer term is like do, you know what happens if that if that goes back hopefully to a normal I, yeah yes. I just, what, so in reality yeah. this wouldn't you wouldn't ever think it would deserve a very high P ratio. Yeah, I think that's fair, right? And this, and this is a high P for today because you know there's big orders coming next two, three years. But as like a run rate, you probably I'd, I'd agree with that. But yeah, the average P shouldn't be too high, I guess. Because yeah. it's just lumpy up and down. But yeah. who knows? Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And I guess, yeah, I, I don't know. I do think that we have, we don't need to go into it all, but I think that the, I think some of the, what's happening with the war in Ukraine and stuff around there, I think a lot of people are seeing that there's, there's a potential for like a lot more conflicts. And I kind of, I was watching a bit of Yuval Noah Harari, the author of Sapiens kind of. Oh, I saw that. that. Yeah. yeah okay like an interview that he gave yeah yeah, yeah. he's just kind of saying like for most of human history we lived in like the jungle effectively like we could always be attacked by a stronger neighbor russia invading ukraine was effectively that right there was not really any cause for war it was like pretty naked it was just because a stronger neighbor wanted to attack just ambition neighbor. yeah yeah, and, and, that's yeah kind of and get more possessions right and and put their people over the other people yeah and so as you have like we've been in this moment since 1945 where that hasn't happened he made the point no country has been wiped off the map since 1945 which used to be quite a common thing yeah. um, there's been wars but just hasn't happened and i think a lot of that was we had this one very dominant superpower that's reversing so it's it, there's a uh, hope there's different ways forward and hopefully the path forward is we do have some kind of collective action to stop it but the fact that we're like moving away from one superpower if the u.s became really insular and didn't want to get involved say with another trump presidency i think you could see a lot more regional kind of conflicts but so, also yeah. nowadays we have much less support for people for having a strong defense force and being able to defend yourself like mm. people are like no we should have a world of peace disarm yeah. don't yeah. have weapons because that's the, the bat's the wrong way and that's the bad thing i'm like i sympathize with that point of view but i'm like dude the other guy's not playing by that rule so like they'll just come and kill you and we've seen with russia what they do to your women and children so like just yeah i think that's the case to be made i think for your think, army yeah. like your we army. don't need yeah, to yeah, walk yeah. around that when we can take <laughs> our kids to the to yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, there's a, the other angle to it is wars are pretty expensive, you know, and the US has spent a lot of money over, well, you know, over history and certainly since sort of 9 11. And their, their budget's not in great shape as well. So I, I don't know. I don't know if like politically there'd be as much. Yeah. For them to intervene as like world police Oof. or something, I don't think yeah. so either. Like it, you've even seen it now with Ukraine, which is relatively very low compared to what mm -hmm. they could be spending. So yeah, I think that that's all. And it, again, Trump is a non-interventionist, isolationist type president. Yeah, yeah, don't need to get into all the politics of it, but I do think there's a case for there'll be a lot more spending. And it becomes a cycle of spending too, because let's say that, you know, Australia decide or whatever country decides we need to rationally be able to defend ourselves. All the other countries around that can see that spending, like it, it, it has that potential. It's not good, obviously. It's better to live in peaceful times, but at each, each individual one, it's also better to be able to defend yourself. So anyway, long term, I could see that being a, a tailwind which does benefit the industry and i think is worth thinking about and there aren't that many opportunities to invest in it do you reckon if trump got in like they would like spend less on the u.s army or just still keep it pretty strong i yeah i don't think he would cut back too much or at least not for veterans blah 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 politically but i don't see them i see them be much more likely to not intervene i guess mm. so yeah, yeah. Like, in oh, terms uh, of the, no if doubt. you think of the like, spending that he's came definitely from, on on team let russia do what they want yeah um, which in terms of like who's been benefiting from all of america's ukraine spending it would be like small contractors in australia suddenly get a slice of that and i, I think that would be much less likely to happen in a in a new theater or even in ukraine like you could just pull out of ukraine yeah like, yeah, so. Trump, Trump will do whatever's good for Trump, if I can just <laughs> say it. And like whatever way, way the wind's blowing, if he feels as though it will reflect favorably on him, he'll knee jerk into it. There's, there's no grand strategy with Trump, I, I think. I is would what say you know. though, I don't, yeah, we're not going to get into a political pro negative Trump thing, whatever. But I would just say he is like, he is consistently quite isolationist. Like he has not done stuff, even though people kind of concerned about, like he, yeah, he doesn't seem to want to actually take, put boots on the ground wherever. And maybe that's, for maybe maybe there's political reasons to that, but it is a, a departure from most US presidents. So 
Yeah. yeah. We'll but there have that. been like isolationist US presidents before as well, right? Like, I mean, it was a big thing, like a long yeah, time not ago. for a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. That was like yeah, before yeah. World War Two. That was kind of argue, arguably part of why World War Two yeah. happened to a degree. It's because America was isolating for a long time. Cool. Anyway, hopefully that's a fun place <laughs> yeah. to end it. With. <laughs> <laughs> that's the good news section. No, no. no at least we at least we can play the piano without having to read music now. Like that's yeah. that's the big takeaway from <laughs> yeah. this episode. This is why we're like going to be easy to invade. We're like, la da 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 da. We'll be in the metaverse and they just. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do we have another small camp to chat about, Claude? Does yes. Need- yeah. 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 Okay. So the other one, which also uh, you guys definitely are, are quite familiar with as well. So chip in whenever you feel like it is Drop Suite, which put out its its quarterly, and it is one of those moments where you're just like, oh man, these guys like. It's like the sun was shining on them a few, you know, a few months ago. They had this big, exciting, you know, the share price got over over egged, I guess, and, and went up, shot up to like 37 cents. Then there was some press around. Oh, sorry, I own shares in this as well, by the way. And, Me too. Yeah, yeah. So it, I didn't buy them at the, at the, uh, the hype either. I bought them like closer to actually the current price. But yeah, so the, then after that, it did, you know, they did have this hype. I'm not quite sure why, but they have had great progress and crossed over the sort of cash flow inflection points so you know been following these ones for quite a few years they have been losing money they've switched over into uh, making money they also still have very a very strong rate of revenue growth the way that they make money is that they have a variety of backup services which manage service providers in it who are their partners they um, sell drop suites product to to their own um clients and then that sort of creates recurring revenue for drop suite it's not super high margin software revenue because they do actually have to pay some for storage so i think it's gross margins of around 68 percent. so that's where they land they're not some crazy great you know incredible moat software company no no far from it but they seem to be able to make money because i guess they make it easy for the managed service providers to make money off their clients off the end client they have you know i guess to to cover the warts on it you know i guess the the obvious thing that is a risk is that they have quite high customer concentration we don't quite know what the largest customer is but in the past quite a few years ago now the business has lost a large a large customer and that was a real genuine setback and I think that's you know best part of 10 years ago now or, or something like that but you know there was a big drop in the share price the the business went backwards a little bit as a result of that so that's that's definitely a risk to keep front in mind what less less of a risk today than it was then yeah yeah absolutely I'll I mean I'll, I'll maybe I'll let you sing its praises a little bit more Andrew but I always like to get especially when I own shares myself I always like to at least highlight you know what I think is a big risk oh you have to man I totally will never stop you from doing that yeah I still quite like it I think that the management is like aligned, honest and con- competent. So that's a big part of it. And I, yeah, I think that I just, I'm impressed by the organic growth. I think that that is good evidence of actual demand for what they're selling. Maybe their products, obviously not the, the highest margin, most incredible, you know, they're not selling a software ecosystem far from it. They're, they're selling maybe a bit of a bread and butter product, which is clearly competitive, not just against potential Microsoft itself, but, you know, a whole bunch of other providers. And yeah, anyway, so obviously like, the numbers are there i like the numbers i have watched management do this for 10 years i think that they are you know not perfect but honest and competent so kind of happy to to back them and and this is the kind of thing where you know if they do well the, the way they speak about waiting for the right acquisition they've got plenty of cash the way they speak it seems sensible they uh, and as as long as they execute well, I'm, I'm sure that there, there's the potential for them to grow their profit probably multiples from where it is today, which after all, they'd need to because their PE ratio is like 110 or something. I, I won't say too much more only because I... Th- pretty sure we covered it about a month ago because we spoke to Sharif and uh, so we sort of I, I sort of laid out the investment case then uh, gotcha well, well let's just say on, on the quarterly it was record operating cash flow that that was a, the, the, the takeaway from me is now just to sort of again a little bit full circle here unlike other sort of tech growth kind of companies yes they've had very impressive ARR growth and very consistently so and all, all of that kind of stuff but I think what we're seeing here is a business that has been exceptional 
exceptionally well managed from from a capital perspective. I think that they we're getting. It'd be nice to see a couple of quarters just to confirm this, but I feel as though we are genuinely at a, an inflection point where it looks as though they will be able to sort of finally unlock some. Well, not finally, but you know, continue to unlock some operating leverage and and sort of deliver on the promise that you want to see for a business like this. I think the the risk that a lot saw in a competing product direct from Microsoft is not insignificant, but not as big as was made out. And yeah, I'm I'm happy to hold and continue to see them execute. Yeah. Anyway, so just top line from the quarterly record, quarterly result, ARR growing healthily, I think 10% quarter on quarter. However, they lost, you know, losing this email backup customer. And so that has meant that their churn has been a little higher than usual. Their churn's still low. They still grew, grew user numbers, but it just shows that, you know, when they do lose a customer, they can just lose tens of thousands, if not more users as a result of that. So that's probably the negative side of the quarterly that we got, but yeah, record quarterly. So yeah, that was good news, I guess. Yeah. Just, just quickly on the, on the churn event there, that was, well, again, take it with a grain of salt, but a legacy, a legacy partner in a developing country, the factors attributed there was macroeconomic challenges. You, so I believe what happened is that country's currency dropped significantly like he said on the call which meant that you know the pricing that they were like no we're pricing us dollars and you know so the price in us dollars is going up and up and up until it's just not the right fit for that country anymore i guess yeah actually going to be interesting to see that phenomenon play out actually in in a much wider context i think in a lot of places potentially all right let's and that's later there. on and we're <laughs> out <laughs> and we're done <laughs> <laughs> we're at an hour. Thanks very much, everyone, for listening. It's our hundredth episode, so thanks for tuning in. We're hearing a lot from you guys on Twitter. We love that conversation on there, so keep it happening at BHB Giants Pod. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. Very cool. Made it to hundred. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for get. Yeah, thanks for getting us this yeah, really far, everybody. It. It's, been, it's always appreciate it's always it. fun. And wow, I, I actually had to double check that hundred. Really, like, doesn't feel like it's been that many. Good time. Yeah, good time. Time flies. Awesome. Yes. All right. Thanks, guys. Catch you next week. Cheers. See ya.